Thank you all for being here tonight. We appreciate you coming out. Wow, I've never gotten an applause for starting on time. <laughs> Cooperative Extension Office here in Carson City. Most people have no idea what Extension is, so I have to give you my quick little elevator speech. The university has three areas, research, teaching, and outreach and engagement. Cooperative Extension is the outreach and engagement portion of the Land Grant University, so the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, and quickly, if you haven't gotten your free radon test kit, uh, January and February are those months. Radon is a colorless, odorless gas that enters your home through the ground, and it is the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. So, if you're concerned that that could be in your home, come by and see us um, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. All right, enough on me. You can read more about me if you're interested in that. If not, I completely understand. Uh, what I do want to talk about real quick is the Sierra Nevada forums are 100% volunteer run. Um, they're continuing to be able to operate in this capacity through some donations from all of you, which we greatly appreciate, as well as a modest grant from the Nevada Human Humanities Group. So thank you to those individuals. As usual, questions will be taken in writing and read to the presenters during question and answer time. There'll be volunteers circulating with index cards with pencils. So be sure and write down any burning questions you might have. If for some reason your questions don't get answered during that time, rest assured that Trisha and Jessica will be here to answer questions afterwards. All right, so moving on what we all are here for, I would like to introduce our two speakers this evening. Closest to me here is Jessica. She's a native Nevadan and has received a degree in biology from the University of Nevada at Reno. She is the Urban Wildlife Coordinator with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Next to her is Dr. Tricia Dutcher. Tricia is um, obviously very intelligent as well, receiving her undergraduate degree. <laughs> I didn't know how else to ease into that. I should have worked on that transition. All right. <laughs> um, she is the wildlife educator with the Nevada Department of Wildlife, and she continues to share what scientists know as students, community members, and fellow researchers. So trust me when I say these two ladies are very well qualified to be here this evening and to speak to you more about wildlife issues. And one last thing I want to point out in your program, they do have some upcoming events. So if you didn't receive a program, grab one on your way out because there's a list of things coming up that may be of interest. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Jessica and Trisha. All right. Everyone hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, so I'm Jessica, and I am the Urban Wildlife Coordinator with the Department of Wildlife. So what that means is uh, I take all of the incoming calls and questions that people have about uh, issues and concerns that they have with wildlife. So it's my job to educate those people on living with wildlife and how we can all coexist together. Uh, so for that reason, I'm going to be talking about some of the more common animals you're going to be seeing in urban environments and or um, animals that I get a lot of questions about, even if you're not going to be seeing them very often. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. First slide, please. All right. So mule deer. Mule deer are uh, all throughout Carson, as I'm sure you know. They get their name from those huge ears uh, that resemble that of a mule. And mule deer are going to be the only type of deer that you're going to see in Nevada. So there's lots of other species of deer throughout the United States. There's going to be the black-tailed deer, which is a subspecies of mule deer. We've also got uh, white-tailed deer, which are more common on the East Coast, uh, but mule deer are gonna be the only ones we have here in Nevada. And mule deer are also going to be the largest species of deer throughout the United States. So a male can be up to 400 pounds, so they can get quite large. They are an extremely social species, uh, so they almost exclusively travel in herds, so anytime you see one, it's very likely that you're gonna see multiple. And depending on the, type of, uh, the time of year, they're gonna form different herds, whether it's a male with multiple females, um, if it's a family group with multiple generations, all of that's going to change uh, throughout the year. 
And they're a very resilient and adaptive species. So they were almost uh, completely extinct uh, in the early 1900s, but due to agencies like the Department of Wildlife and other wildlife management agencies, uh, their numbers are stronger than ever. Next slide, please. So the science behind the seasons. So some of the seasonal changes uh, you are going to be seeing with mule deer. So the first one and one of the big ones is going to be fall migration. Uh, so the picture on the bottom left is going to be what a typical deer summer range looks like. So it's gonna be really high elevation, uh, lots of water, there's gonna be uh, lots of variation in vegetation, and they're all gonna be all spread out throughout this summer range. Um, but then during the winter, they're gonna want to mi migrate down to lower elevations where there's going to be less snowpack for them to fight and uh, just less snow so that they can access uh, the food. And so they're actually, what they're looking for is going to be sagebrush and bitterbrush. And I'm sure you're thinking, why on earth would an animal want to eat sagebrush and bitterbrush? But it turns out it is one of the only plants that keeps its leaves year round. Uh, so it's pretty much the only option for food uh, for deer during the winter. So they're gonna be coming down into these lower elevations looking for that sagebrush. That's going to be a very critical source of food for them throughout the winter. The picture on the right is going to be what a uh, typical mule deer uh, migration corridor looks like. So there's lots of color variation within that line. If you can see, there's little clusters of red. So this is gonna be information we got from putting satellite collars on deer. Uh, so we can learn a lot about their behavior by these satellite collars. And so anywhere you see those little clusters of red, that's going to be a really high use area for deer during their migration. So when they're on these long journeys, they have really important pit stops, so to speak, that they need to stop and eat lots and refuel so that they can continue on their journey. So that's what any of these little red clusters are gonna be, is going to be these fueling stations so that they can uh, gear up and keep going on their journey which can be anywhere from 10 to 150 miles, depending on the herd, depending on where they're going. Next slide, please. So continuing on to some other seasonal changes you're going to be seeing with deer. Uh, next is the winter rut. So the rut is going to be the deer mating season. And during this time, their uh, testosterone levels are going to rise a whole awful lot. And that's going to cause them to be really, really aggressive. Um, the purpose of the rise in testosterone is because they're going to be competing with other males to gain the affection of a female. So they're going to be sparring, using those big antlers to smash into one another, trying to win over the love of a female. This is typically going to uh, peak sometime November to December. And this is uh, a good time for you to watch out for male deer specifically and not come too close because they will be very aggressive. It's intended for other males, but they can be in more aggressive towards humans during this time as well. Uh, during this time, uh, in addition to an increased amount of testosterone, their neck also swells to twice its normal size. Um, and they also get a lot darker, so there's some color variation in their fur as well. So their neck swells so that there's more muscle mass there to support their head while they are smashing into the other males. <laughs> <laughs> so they need that extra muscle mass so that they don't injure themselves. After they have finished the rut and we move into the spring, um, their testosterone is going to drop back down to normal levels. And this is going to trigger um, weakening at the base of their antlers. So where the antlers attach to the head is called a pedicle. Um, and that's going to slowly wither away due to the loss of uh, testosterone. So the bone and the tissue is slowly going to weaken until the antlers literally just fall off one day. Uh, so they drop their antlers every single spring and grow new ones. There's a couple different hypotheses as to why this happens. Uh, one hypothesis is that they do it to replace broken tines. So on antlers, the pieces that come off, each individual one is called a tine, and those can break when they're sparring with the other males. Uh, so one hypothesis is that they uh, grow new ones to replace those. And the other one is that they grow new ones to uh, keep pace with their body size. So as the animal gets bigger, so do the antlers. They're dropped anywhere from January to April, depending on when they finished up the rut, and then they will spend the entire summer growing a whole new set. And if anyone um, out 
side notice the table. We've got two different sets of antlers out there, and one of them was covered with a furry stuff. That's called velvet. And that's what the antlers are going to look like when they're still actively growing. Uh, that picture, if you can see on the bottom right-hand corner, that's going to be what the velvet looks like. So it's covered with hair, it's being supplied with blood, and that's still um, actively growing. As soon as the antlers are done growing, the blood supply is going to cut off, and it's going to start to itch. It's going to feel like a scab on the outside of their antlers. It's going to be super irritating for them, and they're going to be uh, rubbing it off, so they'll find any branch or tree or shrub or anything that they can to rub their antlers on to try to get that off. And then it'll eventually they'll get all the velvet off, and it's going to look like a brand new set of antlers until they break them again in the fall. <laughs> Next slide, please. And into the summer. So the summer is when we are going to see those cute little fawns. Uh, peak fawning season is usually going to be about June. And um, when fawns are born, they can actually be up and walking within 30 minutes of birth. So that's going to be pretty typical of other ungulates, including elk and sheep. Um, their babies are pretty much up and walking right away. And when fawns are born, they are born completely scentless, so they don't smell like anything whatsoever. And one of the things the mom's going to do is, although the fawn can walk, it can't necessarily keep up with her yet, so she will stash the fawn in, hidden in bushes and shrubs for hours on end while she goes out and forages. And in the summer, we tend to see a lot of issues with people coming across fawns that are by themselves and they're worried that they're abandoned. Um, this is not actually the case. So mom is usually close by, keeping an eye on things, out foraging, but the, the fawn is fine. Um, so they are camouflaged, so those little dots on a fawn are supposed to imitate sun streaming through the trees and making sunspots on the valley floor. That's what those spots are supposed to imitate. So they're, supposed to, they're camouflaged, they have no scent whatsoever, and they instinctually know to just sit there and not move. So if you can't see them, you can't smell them, and you can't hear them, they're practically invisible to a predator. So that is the safest that they're going to be, is sitting there by themselves. As soon as humans are intervening and touching them, now you've got your scent all over them, um, and they're a lot less safe, and mom could potentially be spooked. Um, so it's really best if you find a fawn by itself to just leave it be. And it's important to note that females can also be particularly aggressive uh, during fawning season, uh, especially towards dogs. So dogs resemble coyotes, which are a natural predator of fawns, and so they can be especially aggressive uh, towards a dog during this time of year. Next. So what you need to know about mule deer. Uh, first and foremost, it is illegal to feed deer. It's actually uh, very detrimental to their health. So it's generally the food that people give them uh, is, doesn't have the right nutritional content. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't sit well with them, and they can't gain any nutrition from it. Um, it causes an increase in disease transmission among the herd. It can cause increase in aggression among the herd. So there's lots of really good, well-founded reasons why feeding deer uh, is illegal. And it's just, they really honestly don't need it very much. Uh, second, you should never approach a deer any time of the year, um, regardless of when it is. It doesn't matter if it's a male in rut or a female with a fawn or it's just laying there in your front yard looking awful docile. It's still a wild animal. You should not come up and try to pet it. <laughs> Um, if you don't like having deer in your yard, I know a lot of people in Carson definitely welcome it, but there are some that are not a fan of them eating their rose bushes every single day. Um, there are steps you can take to try to prevent that. Um, there's certain plants you can put in your yard that are either um, deer don't like the smell or the taste of them, or they're going to be better at withstanding uh, browsing from deer. So do your research. I've also put out a list out in the lobby that has lots of deer-resistant plants. Um, keep in mind, deer-resistant, not deer-proof. So if it eats it, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and lastly, when it comes down to it, Carson is in historic deer range. So deer are here to stay. At this point, the deer in Carson City are as much part of the community as everybody else in this room. So deer are here to stay. So on to mountain lions. Uh, mountain lions are what we call an obligate predator. Uh, and that means that they have to eat 
only meat. So meat is going to be the only thing that they can derive nutrition from. So they can't, they could eat berries or seeds or whatever else, but they're not gonna gain anything from it. And like any animal, they're going to have diet preferences. Generally for mountain lions, that's going to be mule deer. And anywhere you see mule deer, you're gonna have an overlap of a mountain lion population. Uh, but that's not necessarily always the case. There's been studies that show there's mountain lions that wander up and down the Truckee River eating beaver. There's other ones that show that they specialize in porcupine, which I don't know how you do that, but they did. <laughs> and so they have diet preferences based on whatever is abundant in uh, where they live. And whenever an animal or whenever a mountain lion is done feeding on something, it's going to do uh, something we call cache the carcass. So if it's a mule deer, it's going to eat its fill, which is up to 30 to 40 pounds of meat in one sitting that a mountain lion can eat. And after it's full, it's going to cache the carcass, which means it buries it and covers it with dirt and twigs and branches and all kinds of things to try to camouflage it. Because it's going to leave, it's going to leave the carcass and come back to it and continue feeding off of it for up to 10 days. It's kind of hard for mountain lions to be able to find enough food to sustain themselves, so they have to get every little bit off of that carcass. They are typically a solitary species, so the only time you're going to see multiple mountain lions is going to be um, a female with kittens or like seven to ten days while they're mating. Um, that's really going to be the only time you're going to see multiple together. If you even see one, most people will go their whole life without seeing one. <laughs> And they're the largest cat in Nevada, so it's gonna be the, one of the biggest animals you're gonna find in Nevada for sure, and the second largest in the United States, second only to be jaguar. And if you've ever think, seen, uh, think you've seen a mountain lion, keep in mind that they are an absolutely massive animal. So think to yourself, was it enormous? Because they are up to eight feet long, uh, to the tip of the nose to their tail. They've got a huge long tail, and a male can be up to 220 pounds. So they can be really, really quite large. Next. So the science behind the seasons for mountain lions. Um, when it comes down to it, seasonal activity for predators uh, is kind of boring. It's gonna remain relatively the same throughout the year. There's always going to be meat around for them to eat. So there's not gonna be a whole lot of seasonal changes um, based on their diet. And you're gonna see mountain lions anywhere that we have deer in Nevada. Um, and they can even mate and produce litters any time of the year. So it's not necessarily that there's any kitten season per se, but it usually happens sometime July through September. And mom will keep the kittens around here for one to two years while she raises them, teaches them how to hunt and all that. Next. So what you need to know about mountain lions. 90% of mountain lion sightings are actually another animal, so they're not mountain lions. Um, they are usually a tawny colored dog, um, a bobcat, and I actually get a lot of people that send me um, pictures of mountain lions that they saw that are domestic cats. <laughs> so <laughs> mountain lions tend to create hysteria around people and then one person sees a mountain lion and then everybody sees a mountain lion. Um, but 90% of sightings are something else. Uh, statistically, you are more likely to be struck by lightning than attacked by a mountain lion. I don't mean that to now make you terrified of lightning, but <laughs> statistically, it, it's more likely than a mountain lion. But should you ever see a mountain lion, uh, sightings should be taken seriously. They are a, a dangerous predator. Uh, you should never run from a mountain lion. So when you run, it makes you look like prey and it makes another animal want to chase you. That goes for all predatory animals, including coyotes, bears, wolves, whatever you may see. Never run. Uh, you should just back away slowly. Uh, you could get really close to a mountain lion and it might not even move. Uh, that's because they're ambush predators and they're really good at camouflage. So they think that you haven't seen them yet. That's why they're not moving. <laughs> so just back away slowly and get a safe distance away from it. And lastly, there's a lot of different names for mountain lions. Um, and it just kind of depends on where you're from as to what you call it. So mountain lions, pumas, cougars, catamounts, all the same animal, all the same species, um, no matter where you're from and what you call it. Next. So moving on to coyotes. So uh, coyotes are omnivorous. 
they're definitely going to prefer uh, small mammals, so they're going to be living off of mostly um, rabbits, mice, gophers, things like that. Um, but they are also opportunistic, which means that they'll take advantage of any situation that they get themselves in. So they'll definitely eat fruits and vegetables, they'll eat um, seeds, they'll eat carrion, and on occasion, a domestic animal. Um, but that's definitely not the main portion of their diet. So they are incredibly widespread and adaptable. So coyotes exist literally coast to coast in the United States, all the way up to Canada, down to Mexico. They are everywhere. You cannot escape the coyote no matter where you move. Um, they, uh, and they live in every type of habitat possible. So they can live in the driest of deserts or woodland areas or even in the most urban places. And they can swim really well, so they've even colonized islands. So they can live everywhere, including New York City, Reno, and Carson City. They are everywhere. And coyotes have a very complex and um, very complex social structure. So there's actually going to be an alpha male and female, uh, which mate for life. And they will uh, form family groups. So they're going to defend territories as a group. So that's the purpose of the family group. But they're not necessarily like wolves. They don't all work together to take down an elk. Um, generally, they're going to be hunting uh, on their own and traveling on their own. There is uh, instances of coyotes hunting in small groups or pairs, but for the most part, they're going to be hunting alone. Next. So in the spring is where we're going to see um, coyote mating. And only the alpha pair is going to mate, and they will mate for life. Um, and then in the summer is when we have pup season. And three to seven pups is pretty common. And all of the betas, um, the ones underneath the alphas, are charged with helping raise the pups. So they get to help raise the pups from the year. Uh, and then in the fall is when we see dispersal. So once a coyote is old enough, it gets kicked out of the group and it has to go either become a solitary coyote, find its own territory, or form its own pack. Um, this typically happens in the fall, but not exclusively. And their diet is definitely going to evolve throughout the season. So they're going to be eating whatever happens to be seasonally available. So during the late summer and fall, they're going to be eating lots of berries. Um, and then into the winter, they're going to be eating mostly small mammals and carrion. So any other animals that didn't make it through the winter, they will be feeding off of those. Next. So what do you need to know about coyotes? <coughs> Uh, first, attacks on humans are very incredibly rare. There's only been two fatal coyote attacks on humans in the United States ever in recorded history. Only two. So really, they're not too much of a threat to humans. Uh, if you are going to be feeding other wildlife, uh, you're feeding coyotes. So if you put out bird seed, birds are going to knock the seed onto the ground. That's going to attract rodents, which will ultimately attract coyotes. So whatever you feed wildlife, you always got to be thinking about the food chain. Um, and although seeing coyotes in an urban area is pretty normal, it's nothing to be too alarmed about, if you don't want them there, you should haze them off your property. Um, and that just means you know, yelling at them, chasing them off, banging pots and pans to try to scare them away. Uh, we just don't want them becoming too comfortable around humans, is all. And there are, um, if there's one thing I would want you to take away from tonight, it is please walk your dog on a leash, um, especially if you're out in the hills going hiking or anything like that. There's really no way to protect your dog against coyotes, mountain lions, or other dogs for that matter if your dog's not on a leash. And there's two uh, myths that get circulated about coyotes quite a lot that I would like to dispel. Um, first is going to be that coyotes lure dogs away to be killed. Uh, coyotes are naturally, excuse me, dogs are naturally curious animals. And should it see a coyote, a rabbit, or anything else, it will likely go chasing after it to go see what it is. And the coyote is going to evade. And as I said earlier, they defend territories as a pack. So if there's one coyote, you can bet that there's likely more in the area. The coyote is going to evade the dog until the dog is now intruding on coyote territory, and the other coyotes will defend their territory. Um, so that's how these things happen. But that can be prevented by keeping your dog on a leash. And secondly, coyotes howl to signify a kill. Um, if you look at things from the animal kingdom perspective, getting a meal can be 
quite a challenge and you're not really guaranteed your next meal as an animal, as a wild animal. So from the animal kingdom perspective, it doesn't make much sense to howl and announce to all of the neighboring coyotes that you have dinner. It can make them want to come steal it from you. <laughs> so they howl, yip, bark to communicate with one another to, um, for territorial reasons, but they don't do it to signify a kill. Next, please. So on to bears. So bears are omnivorous. The majority of what a bear is going to be eating is going to be plant-based. Uh, so 85% of what they're eating is actually going to be plants. So that's going to be um, berries, nuts, seeds, roots, all of that sort. They're going to be eating a lot of insects for protein and a lot of carry-on as well. Uh, Bears are going to be solitary, just like the mountain lions. You're not going to see multiple together unless it's going to be a female with cubs. And we have roughly 400 to 700 bears in Nevada. Uh, if you can see the map, the darker area over in the corner of the state is going to be our current bear range. Um, but we are pretty much at carrying capacity, meaning we can't fit any more bears in the space that we have for them. So they are expanding out into those more historic ranges. So all of the other hash marks are going to be um, the historic ranges, so where we used to have bears, but they were hunted out or um, extirpated due to loss of trees many years ago. So they are expanding back into those regions, and they're also coming in from other states. So we've had sightings on the eastern side of the state, so they're coming in from Utah, down from Idaho, Oregon, and California. So there is a huge population connection of bears. Next. So two of the big seasonal changes we're going to be seeing with bears. Uh, the first is going to be hyperphagia. So as an animal is gearing up, getting ready for hibernation, first it needs to get really, really fat. So that's going to be what hyperphagia is. The animal's full-time job is to eat as much as possible and get as fat as possible. During this time of year, a bear can eat up to 20,000 calories in a day. So to put that in per to perspective, that's 56 cheeseburgers in one day that a bear can eat. They can gain up to 25 pounds a week during this time, and they're just going to follow the food based on what's seasonally available. So the maps I have are, again, um, information we've gotten from being able to put collars on bears. So we get really good information from this about the behavior of bears. Um, so the top one is what a typical bear home range looks like. So that's going to be pretty much where the bear hangs out. It looks like it's pretty committed. That's where it gets all of its food. That's its territory, so to speak. That's where it's gonna stay. Um, but they're gonna follow the food based on what's seasonally available. So if you notice, then in the bottom one, um, in the top, it's right um, to the west of Washoe Lake. And then it goes all the way up over Lake Tahoe and ends up in Roseville, California. So they can travel far and wide looking for whatever food is available. So something in Roseville smelled really good and they had to go check it out. <laughs> so they, they can really travel far and wide. So while they may be Nevada bears, we do share the population with all kinds of other neighboring states. Um, next is hibernation. Um, so after hyperphagia is going to be hibernation. So once the animal is sufficiently fat, it can go to sleep for four to seven months. Um, and not all bears are going to hibernate. So hibernation evolved due to the fact that there's no food available for them in winter, so might as well just sleep through the whole thing and then wake up and there's food again. Um, but if there's food year round, then why on earth would you hibernate? So we are learning that more urban bears that live among cities uh, won't hibernate uh, because there's food available all year round. So typically, if they go into hibernation, that's going to be triggered by multiple different things. So one, they have to have enough fat on their body. Um, there's no food available for them. It's going to be triggered by how much light there is in a 24-hour period. Uh, so there's lots of different things that trigger when they're going to go into hibernation. Uh, but one of the really neat things about females is that they are going to have the cubs while they're in the den. And the, they are, the cubs are going to be living off of the females and her fat reserves. So they can have delayed implantation, which means that the uh, egg is fertilized and it won't uh, implant until the bear has a certain amount of fat on its body. She needs to know that she's fat enough to feed herself and possibly one to four cubs all through the winter. So it won't implant until she has gotten sufficiently fat. 
Now next, please. <laughs> so what you need to know about bears. Um, black bears are going to be the only species of bear that we have in Nevada. Uh, but black bears is the species name, not the description of the color. So black bears can be any color. They can be almost blonde. They can be cinnamon, brown, or black. So there's a whole variation of color spectrum. But they're all, if it's in Nevada, it's still a black bear. If you were to be attacked by a black bear, you are supposed to fight back. Uh, eventually, it won't be worth it, and the animal will give up and move on. Um, but most people know that if you're attacked by a grizzly bear or a brown bear, you should play dead, which is true. Um, bears have just an absolutely incredible sense of smell, and they can smell food from up to 10 miles away. So if you think you've hidden your food in the cooler in the back of your car and you're up at Tahoe for the day and you think it's good or it's in the trash can in the garage and that the bear can't smell it, it definitely can. It's just how hungry he is and how willing he is to break into your car to get your food. So for that reason, I would highly suggest that everybody in Carson invest in a bear-proof trash can. Uh, so this picture on the bottom is um, one of the bear-proof trash cans you can get. So this container has to withstand an hour with a grizzly bear gnawing on it with peanut butter and fish inside. So he's pretty, he's pretty motivated to get inside of there. And these have passed, all of these containers have passed. Um, so this one is called a Kodiak can. Um, they're really neat in the fact that they work with um, the traditional waste management pickup uh, machines as, as they get tipped over at the right angle, it'll open up so it doesn't require any locking, it doesn't require anyone to get out of the truck. They're really neat for that reason. And Carson is in bear habitat. Especially West Carson, you're going to see a lot more bears on there, but we have seen um, collared bears uh, walk right through the middle of Carson to get to the pine nuts. So it definitely happens <laughs> all throughout Carson. Um, and it'll do a good job of protecting against other animals as well, raccoons, coyotes, anything else. Next. And my last one for the evening is going to be geese. Uh, so geese are definitely living primarily off of grass and other greenery. And one goose can eat up to three pounds of grass a day. And if you multiply that by the roughly 10,000 geese that we can have at one time in the Truckee Meadows area, that is 930,000 pounds of grass being eaten in a month. So that's a whole awful lot of grass. <laughs> they are a highly social species. They um, are also monogamous and will mate for life. And they will never leave a goose behind. So they all travel in flocks. If one is injured, another one will usually stay back with it. And of course, they are migratory and very widespread. So they can be found all throughout North America. And there's an estimated 4 million geese in North America. So we've got a whole awful lot here. Next. So the science behind the seasons for geese. Um, the males are actually going to stand guard of the nest while the female incubates the eggs. So during the spring, I get a lot of calls from people that are saying, there's a goose just sitting on the roof just staring at me. And it hasn't moved in days. <laughs> What's it doing up there? <laughs> Um, and that's typically going to be a male standing guard over his nest. He just kind of sits there and looks intimidating the best a goose can. And the, the female is going to incubate the eggs, and they can have anywhere from two to nine goslings. And then every fall, they're going to migrate. So if they're coming from up in the north, uh, they need to get away because their water is going to freeze over, so they can't evade predators. And their food's going to be buried in snow. So they got to leave to go find food and water. Um, but Depending on where you live, here we definitely have a resident goose population that's going to be here year-round. They're never going to migrate. So they're going to uh, migrate in the fall. The peak time is usually going to be October to November. Um, but then every single spring, they want to go back to where they came from because they're going to return to the same breeding ground year after year. So we're going to get hit once in the fall and then again on their way back up. Because if you can see in that picture on the bottom, the green is going to be the Pacific Migratory Flyway. And Carson City is right in the middle of the Pacific Flyway. And so like the deer um, that have fueling stops on their migration, same thing with geese. And the Reno-Carson area is a really important pit stop for them on their way down so that they can fuel up and continue on their journey. Next. So what you need to know about geese. They seem to pick just the absolute worst spot to put a nest every single year. It's usually on 
somebody's roof in a really visible area with concrete and cars below. I don't know why they pick it, but they do. Um, but goslings can fall from over two stories and be completely fine. So they're going to have to jump off of there at some point, and they're going to be okay. They weigh practically nothing. They're covered in down. And if there's grass or shrubs of any kind below, then they're definitely going to be fine. But they can fall from two stories onto concrete and be totally okay. Secondly, they know how to find water. Um, they instinctually know how to get back to water, no matter how far away they can be. The goslings can walk right away. They know to just follow mom. They can imprint on almost anything that moves, but usually it's their mom, which is good. <laughs> and they will just follow her back to water. She knows how to get there. And third, they are very, very well adapted to living in cities. Yes, they may have to cross multiple roads to get to water, but that's okay. They're, they've done it for year after year. They pick the same breeding spot year after year. They've done it before, and they'll be okay. It's more important that drivers are safe and people aren't attempting to stop traffic or slowing down or doing anything crazy for the geese. It's more important that the people are safe. And if you don't want geese nesting in your yard, know that if they did it once, that they're probably coming back this year. <laughs> and if you don't want them, you should haze them early, um, before the nest is actually set up. As soon as you start to notice them hanging around and getting some twigs and some grass and whatnot, you should rip out the nest and chase them off. Because as soon as there's eggs in that nest, it's a federally protected animal. There's nothing you can do about it, and there's nothing I can do about it, honestly. <laughs> um, they're federally protected, and you got to deal with it until the goslings are gone. Um, if you were to find a lone gosling, um, it is illegal to t attempt to care for it yourself. There are um, permit holders that have a federal permit to rehab animals, but you do have to have that permit, so you can't take it in and try to care for it yourself. And lastly, if you want to feed geese, that's fine, but bread is bad. Please don't feed geese or ducks bread. It is the equivalent of feeding your kids chips and candy all the time. It has no nutritional value for them whatsoever. So if you're going to feed them, feed them things like grapes and lettuce. It's going to be have a lot more nutritional content and then going to be a lot healthier for them in the long run. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Trisha. <laughs> Can you hear me? Does this? Okay. Uh, so Jess did a great job. She is the person that you call if you have something in your backyard and you're not sure what to do with it. And she's got all the, and that's most of what she talked about. Um, so I get to have the fun job of talking about all the things that you might not see that you definitely still share a habitat with in Carson Valley. So she got to talk about some very specific examples because those are the ones she gets the calls about. I've got a couple groups of animals that I want to share with you. So if we can go um, probably advance two slides. Yeah. The first group is going to be raptors or birds of prey. So uh, again, this is a whole group of animals, but they all have something in common. So the three features that the raptors have in common are going to be the eyes, the beak, and the feet. So raptors are predators, they're birds of prey, so what they all have in common in addition to that is they all eat meat. But that means as predators, their eyes are in the front of their head. They're going to look at you. If you've seen an eagle or a hawk or an owl, they always look like they're judging you, right? <laughs> a little scornful kind of a face. Um, but that's their eyes are in the front close together. They have binocular vision, so that means they can judge distance. They're using those eyes at very keen eyesight as well. So that's one of their main features for identifying and locating prey. Um, and that judgy look is because a lot of them actually have an extra bone ridge over their eyes that helps protect their eyes. It's such an important feature. They've actually evolved this kind of extra protection that covers it in case their prey kicks back, right? So they're all going to have that, those eyes. They're going to have the beak. So you can see here on the bald eagle that very pronounced hook on the beak. So they're all going to have that. Some of it's going to be a little more pronounced on some of the species than others. And you can see we have a couple examples out in the lobby, but that hook is for tearing that meat. So there are some birds that can swallow their prey whole if it's small enough, but even if it's bigger, they're going to be able to tear it apart and swallow those chunks of meat. So that's what that's for. And then the third feature is going to be those feet, those talons. So those eagle claws, those hawks, those talons are going to be just as intimidating as a grizzly bear or a mountain lion 
In some cases, they're sharper, they're bigger. Um, so that is for grabbing their prey. In some cases, it is for killing the prey. They're going to impale them. But honestly, those feet are actually very strong. So in a lot of them, they're crushing the animal. And those claws are really to hold on to it if they're taking off in flight or if they're getting a grip and, and tearing at it with their beak. They sound so gentle, don't they? <laughs> so they have all those, those three features, though, are going to be what makes them a raptor. And then outside of that, there's a lot of differences. So there's different families, eagles. Obviously, vultures are also considered raptors. Uh, they've got the eyes, they've got the beak, they've got those talons for gripping meat, but they actually have very weak feet. And that's because they don't need them to kill animals because most of their food is gonna be already dead, which is handy for them. Um, but hawks, falcons, kites are another family. We don't actually have kites in Nevada, but I wanted to be comprehensive in my list, so I included them. Uh, owls are going to be ones that are specifically adapted at night. So owls also have the eyesight, but they have some other adaptations that make their hearing very keen. So they're going to hunt with that, that sense of hearing as well. And then osprey are another uh, family in and of themselves of raptors that have specialized for fish, for hunting out of the water. Okay, next slide. So despite having those similar characteristics, there's a lot of diversity within that group of raptors. So these are all examples of birds that you have in Carson Valley, which is nice. Uh, on the right, in the, in the upper right, we have the golden eagle. So this is, you can see it balanced on the guy's arm, so this is a big bird, right? Um, very large, one of the largest birds that we have in North America. The condor is actually bigger, but it's a pretty significant one. And then just next to it is the colorful kestrel balanced on a thumb. Right? So we've got the big golden eagle and we've got a little kestrel. So that just gives you an idea of the size difference. That kestrel, you can't take him, you know, he's still a killer. He's still out there getting those lizards and frogs and snakes and shrews. Right? He's still a killer, even though he's so pretty. Um, and we do have a merlin out in the lobby to give you an idea of kind of size, that, that little merlin. But they still have that hooked beak, they still have the talons and those eyes. And then the osprey, so there's differences in size, obviously different in coloration, difference in the prey. So we have the osprey with the fish. Next to him is a cooper's hawk going after pigeons. So if you're walking along and there's a pile of feathers on the trail, that's usually there was a cooper's hawk or um, usually a cooper's hawk, sharp chin hawk. They like to go after other birds. Just explosion of feathers and then it's gone. Uh, below that, we have a red-tailed going, so they're going to go after rodents. We know they go after mice and rabbits. They're also going to go after rattlesnakes and um, lizards, so they have pretty diverse diet themselves. And these birds will go after things, typically we, they hunt in different styles, so a red-tailed hawk, an eagle, a lot of these bigger birds are going to sit perched up, and that's them hunting. So they're not uh, super maneuverable. The kestrel, other falcons like that, are more aerial hunters. They're going to swoop around and look because they fly fast enough that if they see something, they can catch another bird mid-flight, or they can swoop down on it as it's running away and still catch it. Some of these bigger birds are not the fastest birds, so they're going to stay up there and really make sure that they've located their prey and then kind of dive in. And they're going to come out. If it's big prey, it could be bigger than them, way more than them. These are birds, they've got those hollow bones, they don't weigh very much, even though they're big, they may not weigh very much. So if it's a bigger animal, they can still kill it, they just can't fly away with it. So they may stay right there and eat it if they feel safer, but that's also when they're most vulnerable. So they're gonna eat fast. So we got the red tail, then there's a vulture eating a snake, just so you know, they do eat live animals when they can. And then um, on the bottom right, I've got some owlets, some barn owls, Lots of different owls. Um, we know that they're immature juvenile birds because they're so fluffy, right? So we'll point that out, that, that fluff. But you can see the middle one's got a full-sized rat in his mouth. So again, they're still meat eaters. All right, next slide. So as far as the science behind the seasons for birds, as raptors, these are predators. They're going to be more like those mountain lions, right? So predators, top of the food chain don't get a chance to store fat or hibernate or anything like that. They have a very lean protein diet, which means that they're going to constantly need more 
food all the time. So they can't take a break. All year long, they're going to be hunting and they're going to be active. If a bird migrates, we do have hawks that migrate. Osprey will migrate. It really has everything to do with food availability. So if food's available, there's no need to change your habits. right? It's not the cold of the winter that necessarily drives an animal to migrate or hibernate. It's the food availability. So for us, uh, most of our raptors are going to stay around in the area. Osprey will migrate because they are hunting fish. And if that lake freezes over, when the river freezes over, they no longer can do that. And so that's when they tend to migrate south. And they're looking just for unfrozen water. Right? If we stay warm and have a non-winter, <laughs> then they might stay. Uh, in the spring, they're all going to do what birds do in the spring. Right? They all build their nests, and they all have their kids. They have these hatching families. Most raptors are going to be birds that mate for life which is a cool thing, that they pair up and stuff, but um, they don't necessarily hang out year-round together. So the bald eagles are famous for their dating, their mating ritual. They're going to find each other each spring, and they fly up real high, and they're going to lock talons and just do this death drop. They look like they're just spiraling out of control until they're like within six feet of the ground, and suddenly they let go and they can fly back up again. And every time you see it, you're like, this is going to be the one they're going to hit. And miraculously, they come back up. This is a bonding experience, this thrill dive for them. So they'll set up their nest. They'll have their eggs. They'll stay around. They'll help raise the chicks. And, and in the case of the bald eagles, then it's like, great. I'll see you again next year, same time, same place. We got a date. Um, some of them will hang out, so there are some hawks. I work at Oxbow Nature Study Area off the Truckee River in Reno, and we have a pair of red-shouldered hawks, which is a bit unusual for our area, but there's a pair there, and I see them together all year round. So in some cases, the birds will hang out as a set. In some cases, they find each other at the right time every year. Right? Uh, so they do help raise the chicks, the offspring there, but they're really kind of terrible parents. They're hunters. This is a skill, right? Judging your prey, finding it, pouncing it, giving that good death blow real quick before you get hurt yourself. Um, and they just don't spend that much time with the kids. It's like a month, and it's a pass-fail course kind of thing. So what we see is even though red-tailed hawks are actually one of the more common raptors, 95% of them don't make it through the first year. Right? And that's usually winter. It's just they don't learn how to hunt very well, and it's usually these high starvation rates is what's killing them more than anything. Okay. So what you need to know as far as raptors go is uh, we get a lot of call in the spring, especially late spring, because those chicks are on the ground. They're these big birds. They still have some fluffy feathers on them maybe, so you know it's a juvenile, and instinctually you want to help. But again, the parents aren't, you know, this is a tough love sort of a parenting situation. And when those kids are learning to fly, you know, they kind of flap their wings and they fall to the ground. The parents usually around somewhere up in the trees, kind of every now and then giving them some words of encouragement. But these are birds that have to learn how to fly. They have to strengthen those wings. And so you're going to find these kind of fledgling tween aged birds on the ground a lot in the spring. So you really just want to leave them alone. That's part of their learning curve. It is tough love. You really want to help, but it's best just to leave them alone. Um, the other thing we get a lot of calls about when it comes to raptors, some people love them, some people hate them because they want to feed the birds in their backyard and that Cooper's hawk or that red-tailed hawk keeps eating their favorite backyard birds. So again, as Jess mentioned with the coyotes, if you are feeding any wildlife, so if you're putting a bird feeder out, you don't really get to pick which animal is going to come up and take advantage of your generosity. Right? There's no way to choose which bird's coming up or who's going to come eat that bird or who else is going to come eat that seed. So just be aware of that. Uh, as far as your pets go, they have the ability to go after your pet, but honestly, that's not really an issue. We don't actually see a raptor successfully get it. It happens every now and then, a cat, a very small dog, something along those lines. But for the most part, if you keep them on a leash, if you keep them in your yard, um, there's enough activity that that hawk's going to keep its distance. 
The other thing you should know is that raptors are federally protected, all of them, all parts of them. Right? It doesn't necessarily mean that they're all endangered, it just means at some point in time there was the threat that they were, um, and that came from the idea of artifacts using their feathers, right, or their bones, or something along those lines. Um, so there's this idea that collection was a big problem. So now they're all federally protected, and that means that you can't have one, you can't shoot one, but you can't even take a dead one that you found on the ground. You can't find the feathers on the ground and take them home. Because if you get busted with that feather without a permit, then you're in trouble. So all parts of them are protected as well. And that's important for you to understand. Okay. So another group of animals that we have that I love to talk about that people often forget are bats. We actually have 23 species of bats in Nevada. There they are. Um, what we have in Nevada are what we call microbats. So there are such things as megabats that have wings as big as my arms. We don't have those. So you don't have to worry about those guys. What we have are bats whose bodies are like the size of the palm of my hand. Their wings are a little bit longer, but nothing about these bats are that big. Right? And the good part about these little bats that are running around Nevada is that for the most part they all eat insects. We have one species that drinks nectar and helps um, pollinate cactus and agave plants. So if you're a tequila drinker, you like him, because that's how we get tequila. But for all the other ones, they're eating insects. They're eating all the creepy crawly things that are running around the desert at night, which I like as well. So that's these guys' job. Next slide. So what I want you to know about bats, besides the fact that they're you know, eating all the bugs that you don't like and that kind of thing, is that these are not mice with wings. Not only are they not rodents, they're their own order of mammal, but they don't have anything in common with rodents other than their size. They are the size of a mouse. But other than that, when you think of a small mammal, these are usually um, bottom of the food chain, they don't live very long, they reproduce like crazy, right? That kind of thing. And bats aren't like that. Bats are long-lived. They'll live anywhere from 20, 30, 40 years in the wild. Right? Not at all what you'd expect from a small mammal. And they're only having one offspring a year. These are small mammals that fly, so they have to have enough fat and, and body weight to produce milk to nurse and still fly around. So they're not birds, they're, you know, they're differently adapted, so they just can't support the weight that it would take to support multiple offspring. So most of them only have one pup a year. There's a couple of them that are a little bigger body that might have two or three offspring, but again, nothing to the extent of a, of a mouse or a muskrat, as we're about to find out. Um, so they also have a very rich social life. So some of them will roost in big colonies, and in that case, on the right here, you actually have, it's a colony of free-tailed bats, and the mothers will all roost together, and they'll have their pups, and they leave all their pups together in the cave, the bridge, wherever it is they happen to be, and they'll kind of all fly out, and they come back and they find their one pup out of the hundreds of thousands of them. They can identify their one pup by smell, by cry, they'll go find it. But if something happened, if an owl got one of those other bats while it was out, they're gonna adopt her baby as well. So they're gonna look out for each other, right? There's been studies in England of brown bats where those are bats that don't hang out in these giant colonies. So a couple of them might roost over here in this tree, and a couple of them might find a bat box over here. But what they found is that they have best friends. They go out, they go hunting on their own, and then they always find the same other bats to go find a roost with for the rest of the night. Right? There, it's not a mating pair, it's literally best buds kind of a thing. So there's lots of actually fascinating things, they're just really hard to study. They're small animals that fly around at night, so you can't just sit there in the field and observe them the way that we do with other wildlife. Um, they're very small and fly, so you can't put a collar on them like you would a deer or something like that because that extra weight, I mean, on the ounce, it's just, it's a lot of energy for them and it's too taxing on them. So it's very hard for us to actually study them um, and we don't always have the resources to do it since we're not deriving too much economic gain from them. So it's a whole order of mammal out there 
that um, what we do learn is fascinating, but a lot of it we just don't know. So uh, it's going to be exciting to see more and more research be done and what we find out. Okay, next slide. Yeah. So the science behind the seasons is again migration totally depends on food. So we know we have animals that migrate. We know we have species of bats that come up. So the free-tailed bat comes in these large colonies. They'll come up and roost over the summer, and they tend to go back down to Southern California or Mexico, Vegas, you know, someplace more fun in the, in the winter. Um, but there's other species that will migrate. There's some that, of the same species, that'll stick around and hibernate. Some of them of the same species don't do either. They'll just stick around and keep hunting. It just depends on if the food's available to support them. So it's all about food availability. And we do know that they will change homes seasonally. So they may stay in the area, but they're going to change to a different roost. If it's a cave-dwelling species, if you get a bunch of bats hanging out together in a closed environment, it's high humidity. They're all breathing out CO2, which is going to build up in that cave. They're dropping a lot of guano. So it gets a little funky in there, right? So they do change to a different location seasonally, and it helps change up that air. And then they'll go back, you know, give it a year or two, and they'll go back to that same site. So they're, they're habitual, but they know that they have to change to a new location on occasion. Uh, we've got them that they'll come. You guys may have noticed some bats in your roof or under your porch or something like that. So they're going to come hang out for different amounts of time. At night, when they go out to fly around, they can't fly all night. They go out, they gorge themselves. They're going to take a little nap after lunch, just like we all wish we could. So they might hang out under your porch just for a couple hours at night and then fly off again. Um, same thing during the day. They may just be there for a day or two, and then there's another main roost that they go back to. And then, of course, if they want to hibernate, they may find some place in your attic or something that looks great to them. Um, what we want you to know is that you can't disturb them when they're hibernating. So the way a bat hibernates, it, it can't build up the fat layer the way a bear can. Bears are actually very unusual in the way that they hibernate. So bats can't live off this huge amount of fat because you can't pack on all that weight and still hang upside down by your toenails. It, it doesn't work. So they pack on as much weight as they can, and then they shut their body down to almost a freezing little bat popsicle status. Right? Bears still maintain a high rate of body temperature and respiration, whereas bats really do just slow way, way down. And they reserve that fat for when they wake up and to raise that body temperature back up. It burns up all their fat all at once just to get them up to operating status. And then they got to go find food right away. Right? So if they're hibernating and you disturb them, they'll wake up. They'll burn up that fat reserve, and if there's no food around, they're going to starve pretty much immediately, right? So we know that if they're hibernating, to leave them alone. Um, and when they leave, then you want to bat-proof your space again. So right now is a good time to do that. If you've had bats come over the summer and you didn't like it, if they shouldn't be there now, now is a good time to bat-proof your spaces. Um, if they're in there over the summer, we don't really want you to kick them out. We want them to leave on their own, because if they're over the summer, they might be having pups and you don't want the moms to abandon the pups in your walls or your attic either. That presents its own problems with little bodies being left behind. So you want the bats to leave on their own and then bat-proof the space before they come back the next season. If a bat flies into your house and it's just flew into your house one night, odds are it was chasing a bug in through a window or a door, right? So at night, we turn the lights on, the bugs are attracted to the lights, and the bats are just going to follow the bugs right in. So if you do get a bat flying around your house, the best thing to do is turn the lights off and open the doors, and the bats will find their way back out. Right? You don't want to swing a broom or a tennis racket or something at them. They're small animals with fragile little wings. So kind of give them a break and just give them the out, and they'll find their way. OK. So the other thing you need to know is bats get a bad rap when it comes to rabies. Um, Part of that is the, the idea of rabies, really, that scare comes from the East Coast, where there's a lot of water. Any mammal can have rabies. Absolutely any mammal can carry the virus. And it's spread through saliva. So where they have a lot of water, they have denser populations of raccoons and skunks and all kinds of mammals that are going to come in conflict more often. And their rabies really is an issue. But out here in the West, where we don't have a lot of water, we don't have those dense populations, and the virus just doesn't get a chance to spread as much. 
Um, you can get rabies from bats. They're capable of carrying it, but so is your cat and your dog, right? So what we know is less than half a percent of the bats are carrying rabies. And what the virus does for bats, it doesn't make them more aggressive. It actually paralyzes them. So often a bat that has rabies is going to fall down to the ground, which is usually how we get it because someone sees a bat on the ground and goes to pick it up and it turns its head to bite and that's how you get it from a bat. So big picture is don't touch a bat. If you see it on the ground, don't touch it. If it's sick, you don't want to pick up a sick bat. If it's not sick, it's going to crawl up to something, the closest tree or something, climb up it and, and then take flight from there. Bats aren't very good at flying just from the ground. They're really good at dropping into flight, but really bad at just trying to pick themselves up off the ground. So they might be crawling along. They're still fine. Let them just crawl someplace. If they're not fine, you don't want to pick them up anyway. So don't touch a bat. The other thing to know is nine species of the bats in Nevada are actually protected by law. So you don't want to harass those in any way. We frown on that. Um, but it includes these two. So the first one on the top with the really big ears is a spotted bat. We have an example of him in the hallway. Spotted bats are one of my favorite because of those ears. Those ears are so huge that when they are roosting, it lets too much heat out, right? So when they're roosting, they actually deflate their ears to save that energy. And then when it's ready to go, they're gonna pump blood back into them and they <laughs> reinflate. Uh, the bottom one is a red bat. We have an example of him out in the lobby. So these are both bats that are going to go after flying insects at night. So thus the giant ears on the spotted bat, that's to help him with echolocation. The red bat is totally different. He's actually got teeny tiny little ears, but he has that circular face like an owl. So the face becomes a dish that receives those, those um, sound waves back, and he's using that to, to locate his prey. So there are two different ways of adapting to the exact same ability. Okay. So my last group of animals are aquatic mammals. These are awfully, they're going to be anywhere we have water in Nevada. And people don't think about water in Nevada, but we do have rivers and tributaries and drainage areas and irrigation ditches, and all of those are going to be home to these kinds of mammals. And I get asked all the time, oh, I saw this, do you think it was an otter? I saw a baby beaver. Right? What do you think it is? So they can be very easily confused. They're all going to have similar traits because they're all mammals adapted to living in the water. So they're all going to have these cute little ears that they can fold down flat against their head to keep the water out. Same thing with their nose. Right? They, um, they'll all have these lens over their eyes. They all have the same fur. It's all this chocolate brown fur that's double layered. So they've got a longer layer on top that the water is just going to drain off of and then that thick, fuzzy, fleecy layer underneath that keeps them warm. But that also means it gives them all the same texture. So because the water just flows off that top layer, they all look like they just got towel dry when you see them. All have that same texture. Um, they're all going to have similar feet. They all have long tails. A beaver has a very uh, recognizable tail. But they're all going to have a thick tail that they use in the water. So if you don't see the beaver tail, it could just be under the water. You still don't know what kind of animal it is because um, it's going to leave a wake behind it no matter what animal it is. They're all found in the same habitat. They all live along the waterway and burrows. Um, they're all active all year long. So just telling me you saw this brown thing swimming in the water, it's not going to narrow it down. Right? So we're going to look a little bit and compare. So next slide. Oh, right. So here's some examples. So this is a zoomed in shot. But you can't tell if that's the same as this little animal underneath, which is a muskrat. Next one. That guy, because at a distance, if you, you on the water, you can't, you don't have anything to scale the animal against. Right? So next slide. That could be the same animal. So we're gonna go through and kind of compare some of them. So next slide. We got two groups of them. We've got aquatic herbivores, so the plant eaters, and aquatic carnivores, our meat eaters. So we have a small herbivore and a large herbivore, and then we're going to have a small carnivore and a large carnivore, right? So comparing the herbivores, we have the muskrat, little two-pound muskrat, right? He's about two feet from his nose to the tip of his tail. He's a little puffball, um, and he's basically a tiny beaver. They have all the same behaviors and characteristics. 
except for that big fat beaver tail. And when he's swimming in the water, this is the one everyone swears, I saw a baby beaver. Baby beavers are not gonna be swimming on their own, ever, right? So if you see one, it's probably a muskrat, right? They still have a very thick tail, and it's still easy to uh, mix up those tails. They're native here, but they were introduced in Europe specifically to replace the beaver fur industry, right? And that's because they have 15 to 50 <coughs> offspring a year. Because they'll have three different sets of offspring, and each one can have 10, 20 kids in that litter. So they're prolific breeders, and they're easy to raise in a small area, so they actually raise them um, specifically for their fur. And that's because it has that same double layer, super soft brown coat. The beaver is much bigger. He's gonna be 40 to 100 pounds. So we have a full mounted stuffed beaver that's in the lobby. That is a medium beaver. He's not even a large one, and that's usually what everyone comments on is, I didn't realize how big a beaver was. And he's just medium sized. His name's Cornelius. <laughs> so you can go get a picture of Cornelius. <laughs> Um, but they can get up to 100 pounds and up to four and a half feet. So big, it's a big animal. Um, they are ever growing. That's how they can get that big is they never stop growing and neither do their teeth. So those rodent teeth, those orange teeth up front are actually constantly growing as well. So we know that beavers can chop down trees with their teeth. They're really just going after that outer layer of bark. They're eating the bark and that layer just inside the bark. They're not eating the wood itself. They'll take that wood and use it to build a dam or build their lodge, but they don't eat the wood. They're eating leaves, they're eating bark, that layer just underneath the inner bark, new growth, that kind of thing. And then those tails are very handy. They use them as rudders in the water. You can't put the brakes on in the water. So the tail helps with turns and stops and things like that. Um, they can use it to slap the water to warn each other. If you've ever seen a beaver do that, it sounds like a giant boulder just got thrown into the water right in front of you. And even when I know it's coming, I'm watching the beaver and I know he's gonna do it, it still shocks me every time I jump. Um, but they also use it on land. So on land, they can lean back on it just like a kangaroo leans back on his tail. And they'll use it as a kickstand so they can stand up and reach up and grab branches with leaves on them and pull them down to them. So it's a pretty handy thing to have. And they have very close families. They do not have 50 offspring a year, so this is a difference between them and a muskrat. They're gonna have two to four kits in a year, and they keep them around, and then next year, those kits will actually stay around and help take care of their new younger siblings. So this is very much a family operation, and they'll stick around for a couple years before they get booted out. Everybody helps maintain the, the lodge, everybody helps maintain the dam, they all hang out together, so you don't see a baby beaver by itself. It's gonna have babysitters or parents nearby. And they do mate for life, so they're definitely a bonded pair. And then we have our carnivores. So again, we have our small two pound, two foot mink. It's basically a ferret that's adapted to hunt along waterways. Um, they are adapted, they'll go diving under the water and slow their heart rate down so they can hang out under the water a little bit longer. So they're down there chasing fish, chasing crawdads, that kind of a thing. Um, the very strong sense of, of hearing and of a keen eyesight underwater, terrible sense of smell, which is probably good because mink actually can squirt out like a skunk. And my understanding is it's like 10 times worse than a skunk. So it's probably good they can't smell themselves. Um, they purr when they're happy, which is, I know, so cute, right? This cute little ferret that purrs, but they are homicidal. You have to remember that these guys are obligate carnivores as well, just like a mountain lion. They cannot derive nutrition from plants, so they have to hunt. And so they have the aggressive instincts of a mountain lion, right? They're gonna hunt anything that they can catch. So they're going after crawdads and like big aquatic invertebrates, but they're also gonna chase a muskrat down its hole and kill it, and a muskrat's the same size. They will go after birds bigger than them. So they'll take a duck and flip it upside down and drown it in the pond, right? I mean, vicious little, cute, they purr. Remember, they purr, cute. But these are very aggressive predators as well. So they're gonna go after your chickens and things like that too. Um, and then we have the otters. So the otter's the big version. Again, it's in the weasel family. They have that slinky body and 
Um, a lot of the same characteristics there. Not quite as aggressive. Those minks are just ornery for their size. So, but they're going after a lot of the same animals. So again, small mammals, birds along the river, fish, if they can catch them. So typically a river otter is not going to go after the trout until winter hits, because winter slows the fish down enough for those lazy guys to go after them. Uh, the other cool thing about otters is that they are social animals. They do form groups. It's not always a family group. It could just be best friends, uncles, cousins. Some sort of social hierarchy gets set up. We do have them. We know we've spotted them along the Truckee River. We've had reports, but again, everyone just tells us there's this brown thing swimming in the river. We think it's an otter. So we tend to not trust it unless we get a photograph that proves it. So we know there have been reports of them along the rivers here, but um, not enough for us to think that there's a large population. So we just don't know that much because they're hard to catch, they're hard to see. So it could just be one group that's kind of cruising up. They go tubing down the river in the summer. You know, they cruise down, we see them, and then we don't see them again. But we know they're around. They do live in burrows along the river way, but they can't dig their own burrows because they have very sensitive paws. So a lot of what they're doing is they're diving underneath and they're going through the rocks looking for those crawdads and mollusks and clams and things like that that are in that rock layer at the bottom of the river. So that's most what they're going to go after and eat because they do have those sensitive little paws. Okay, next slide. So as far as the seasons, again, all four of these species are active all year long. There's not a lot of difference in their behavior. Um, the biggest difference is, is the otters can actually catch the trout because the trout slow down, so they get a little more fish in their diet. But really the beaver's the one that's driven by seasons. So that whole point of building a dam that the beavers are famous for, that's a seasonal response. So the purpose of the dam is to create a pond. And the purpose of the pond is to have water deep enough that when winter hits and it ices over that top layer, there's still a deep enough layer in the water that they can swim around and they actually stash summer food in there for the winter. So they'll take a branch that has green leaves on it, shove it in the mud at the bottom of the pond, that cold water acts as a refrigerator, and in winter, they can swim around down there and still pull off some green leaves that they can eat. They'll come up and eat bark off the trees as well, but they've got that stash in that pond, but that means the pond has to be deep enough to cover those leaves and still have an ice layer on top. Does that make sense? So that's the point of that dam, is to create that, that depth of a pond. So this is a picture a couple years ago when we had that big drought. The Trekker River pretty much almost dried up and the beaver got very ambitious and tried to build a dam across the whole river. So I had to keep pulling it out. I thought the governor was gonna call me saying, why are you damming the Trekkie River? Um, but, I mean, he did a pretty good job for a bit there. So in the fall, we see a lot more trees being knocked down because they're fervently trying to make sure that that pond is deep enough before winter hits. Okay, next slide. What you need to know is if you have an irrigation ditch, right, a drainage canal, you live anywhere near a pond, a lake, a river, if there's cattails anywhere near you, then you have some of these animals living nearby, possibly all three of them, Maybe not so much the otter itself, but the mink, the muskrats, the beavers. It's an estimated 70,000 beavers in Nevada. So this is not a rare species. They're just nocturnal, so you don't see them as often. And they're smart, so they know if you're active, they'll hide from you and come out at night when they don't see you. So usually if it's a smallish animal, it's going to be a muskrat or a mink. right? And mink have that long, slinky body, and muskrats look like little puffballs, really. OK? And I think that's it. So, some fun time. I'll start us with a couple of questions in the interim. So, both of you have talked about species that mate for life. What should happen if the partner is dies or is killed? Do they find a new partner? Uh, how does that work? So, yes, if one dies or they lose their partner for any reason, then they will find a new partner. Okay, questions are still coming. Jessica talked about um, bears will wait to fertilize an egg. So what happens if the bear never gets fat enough for that to happen? Will she still have a pregnancy or the, her body will terminate it? Yeah, so her body will terminate the pregnancy. So it, it's fertilized, it's sitting there ready to go. It just needs to implant um, and it just will not do that if she doesn't get fat enough because she won't survive the winter if she doesn't have enough fat to make it for herself and all her cubs. So it just won't happen at all. All right. 
Okay, so some questions. Why are there no elk in this part of Nevada? <laughs> Uh, so due to uh, habitat reasons, we just don't have the, quite the right habitat on the western side of the state. So um, likely way back when, there probably was small populations of elk on the western side of Nevada. Um, but you know, in the early 1900s, when everything else was hunted out, so were the elk. Um, and uh, the elk that we have now on the eastern side of the state were introduced by the Department of Wildlife and they chose not to introduce them on the western side of the state because it doesn't have quite the right habitat requirements. So on the eastern side of the state near um, you know, Elko County, they get a little bit more water than us. They have a little more diversity of plant life. They have more grasses and things. Uh, so they just have a better elk population. Um, but due to um, that collar data that we get from putting collars on animals, uh, we do know that there are elk moving this direction, so at some point in the future, we could once again have a small population of elk. Very interesting. Okay, is it true or not that coyotes uh, can mate with domestic dogs? It is possible um, that they can hybridize. Uh, it doesn't happen super often, uh, but it is technically, um, scientifically possible, yes. <laughs> are mink native to Nevada? Um, we have them. It's the beaver is actually one that has been debated on whether or not beaver are native to Nevada. And there's been uh, different evidence supporting that. Because we know that when we introduced them in the 40s, I want to say. But um, so that one's contested. But mink are native, and they are also farmed. So there's um, farmed mink that to have slightly different colorations and sizes that have escaped and, and um, changed the color of native meat that they can breed. But we do have a, a native population. All right. We have a couple of deer questions now. So how is or should the deer population be managed in town? So, can it be managed? <laughs> yeah, it, it's difficult to say. Um, you know, deer are part of Carson City at this point. You know, you're in historic deer range, they're going to be here. Um, so it's kind of up to people to know how to handle the deer, know what they need to do if they don't want the deer in their yard. They need to know that um, they should slow down at dawn and dusk. That's when the deer are going to be uh, particularly active and uh, moving about. Um, so it's kind of hard to say what exactly management is. Um, if there's a super aggressive deer that's causing a public safety concern, we, we will be involved. Um, and if there's an injured deer, we should do our best to be involved um, with the limited staffing that we have. So that's the extent that the deer in Carson are managed. Okay, and you just touched on one of the next questions. Uh, what should someone do if there is an injured deer that they observe or see in town? So if it's still um, you know, actively getting around pretty good, it's kind of hard for us to get intervene too much. You know, if it can, if it's still pretty mobile, when you see it, by the time we get somebody out here, it's going to be long gone. Um, if it is really seriously injured, uh, we do have a dispatch department, and um, you would be able to call our dispatch department, and they could get a warden on scene uh, to come and remove the deer. Is what would happen. We don't have rehab facilities for deer, so it would have to be euthanized, unfortunately. All right. Do we have weasels in Nevada? We do. We do have uh, a couple different species of what you basically call a weasel. We have the ermine, there's a long-tailed weasel, short-tailed weasel. They all kind of look alike. Um, and they are going to do that really fun coloration change. So in the winter, they're going to go white with like a little tiny brown tip tail, and then they'll go back to a brown with like a white chest and belly. Um, and, and they're weasels, so they're just like the meat. Super cute little killers. <laughs> so they're going to go after um, little ground squirrels and, and whatever they can catch as well. But we definitely have a couple different versions of weasels here. All right, so we've got a couple questions that are about hunting. Uh, can hunters kill bears in their dens in Nevada? Mm. In their dens? In their dens is the question. Bears, um, so there, it, it's legal to hunt a bear, but there is a very specific season. There's all kinds of rules that go around with that. Um, at a certain point, you have to constantly check whether we close the season, because once a certain quota is hit, um, we'll stop the season at that date. It's not like it keeps going. 
So um, my understanding is that a den bear is not a legal hunt and that it's not even the season at that point. Yeah, typically when the season is happening, bears are not hibernating. So the bear is only going to be in its den when it's hibernating and by that time the season's closed. So it's usually not a conflict we would see. Okay, so if someone is aware of that, it sounds like you should let the officials know because it is yeah. illegal. Yeah. When and where, or when and for what reason would someone possibly kill a predator out of the normal hunting season? Um, You're always allowed to protect yeah. yourself. Exactly. Right? That's, that's your, your right, for sure. Um, you're allowed to protect yourself, your property. If you're noticing that a predator is coming after livestock, if there's something along those lines, you can call us and get a depredation permit where you're saying there is a threat. Um, if it's not an immediate threat, then you need to call and get a depredation permit. If you are protecting your life or the life of your family, then obviously that's an understandable act, but you're gonna have to show that because it's a regulated animal, so you need to be able to defend that action. Okay, so let's move to raptors. If you poison mice, can it kill the raptors that might eat, potentially eat the mice? Definitely, definitely. That was one of the threats, it's one of the reasons they're protected, um, is they're at the top of the food chain. So anything that affects along that food chain is going to hit those top predators even more. So uh, they're gonna eat, it's not that one mouse that you eat, it's the 20 mice that have some poison in them that they're eating that's gonna build up in their system. So definitely that's gonna be an issue. Okay, so a better mouse control alternative would be sticky traps? Well, you could, but the best <laughs> I'm starting one, to search for an answer. Right? The best one is prevention of that mouse being in your house. All right. It's always fun to find those two. Um, but to locate, is there a food source? Is there um, an entryway? Is there something along those lines where prevention is always better? <coughs> Should dead raptors or abandoned chicks be reported and how? Uh, so okay. dead, yeah, dead raptors, uh, you can give us a call. So there's not necessarily a specific reporting system for it. There's places that you can take it to donate it that it'll be used for educational purposes. UNR accepts um, raptors in good condition. Um, and if it's an eagle, then there is a uh, federal repository for the um, parts because uh, tribal uh, groups can go and ask for eagle parts. Um, so you can put it there, but it's kind of up to you. You just can't keep it is pretty much what it comes down to. So if you were to call me, I could tell you, you could either take it somewhere to get it donated for educational purposes, or I would give you the proper disposal, which is making sure you wrap it up really good or burying it, um, but you just can't keep it yourself. Plus, leaving a dead animal is an option. It's naturally going to happen, the animals die, and nature has things that will naturally dispose of it for you as well. So that's always an option, just leave it there. <laughs> okay, this person has muskrats in the stream behind their house, and the stream does go dry sometimes. Do the muskrats die? Probably not, otherwise they wouldn't be there. They're just going to find, they'll find some water. Muskrats don't need that much. Uh, a lot of what they're going after is going to be water plants like cattails, but the plants will still be around when the water's not there. It's not that they need to be in water like a whale does or something like that. It's just the easiest way for them to get around is to find the food that they're looking for. So they're probably still in the area and just, you know, praying for rain themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Do bears learn our neighborhood garbage collection behavior? Yes. <laughs> Uh, bears are incredibly intelligent animals and they can pick up on um, behaviors and things that happen consistently. So yes, they know that Tuesday is garbage day and that it is a buffet for them. Hence why I really suggested everyone get wildlife proof containers because bears know. <laughs> right, they're going to know which house put the garbage out the night before versus the houses that put the garbage out that morning. So they'll have a round that they take. That's clever. Difference between Carson and Eagle Valley wildlife populations. In Eagle Valley? Uh, the difference between Carson Valley and Eagle Valley. This is Eagle Valley here. Carson Valley is mainly Carson. Gotcha. They're not. There's not going to be. Um, nah. Yeah, it's going to be relatively the same. You're going to have bears, mountain lions, deer, coyotes all throughout both areas. 
raptors of all kinds. Yeah, I was gonna say that, I mean, they might be different populations, but in a lot of cases, you probably share the same population of animals even, especially for predators. All right, do all bears hibernate, or are there any bears that do not hibernate? So currently, right now that we know of, we have three bears with collars on that are still out and wandering. Um, so not all bears hibernate. Again, it's just back to if there's still food available, then they won't hibernate. They don't have to hibernate. Um, so it, it's just based on what food is still available. It's not necessarily this bear is never going to hibernate, and this one always will. It's just based on what's around them and if there's still food or not. Do you offer talks to small groups? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, we'll have cards in the lobby too, so if you have other groups or classes or clubs or homeowners, I mean, definitely, we'll give you a card, just send us an email. All right, that's all the questions I have, so let's give our speakers a big round of applause. <laughs> Again, thank you all for coming. Be safe.